check podcasts. The Bread and Butter Collective is a collection of hospitality professionals working together to help strengthen our industry to build strong culture, community, and sustainability. I'm Kalen McNeil. And I'm Sam Jones. And And this this is is the the Bread Bread and Butter Butter Podcast. Welcome to the Bread and Butter Podcast. Hi, Sam. How are you? (laughs) Good, Kalen. How are you doing? And where are you? I'm in Calgary. Oh. Calgary, but sounds like Victoria is as bad. Well, uh, Calgary, Calgary is the the sloppier, slightly slightly hotter version of Calgary right now. Here's like minus fifty down there. Is that true? Well, it was last week, I believe. Yeah, it was minus thirty five when I got here. Oh, jeez. But it's it's warmed up a bit. I think it's minus twelve or minus ten or something now. So. Oh, that's t-shirts yeah, and shorts Canadian weather. Winters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Well, exactly. we've got snow in Victoria right now. It's coming down pretty wet and slushy, and the roads aren't aren't super happy. And hopefully, business keeps up. People aren't afraid to go out and you know go spend their hard-earned money at restaurants. I hope they continue well, to do that today. I think the business just gets spread out a little bit, so I think the budget is still there. Just you know, for what we don't get today, hopefully tomorrow. This is the optimist in me. I love it. On snow days. I love your optimism. Keeps me going. Um, we, have, and, we have another optimist guy on, on our panel today, too. Why don't you introduce him, Seth? Sure. Well, I would, I would love to introduce Greg. He's uh, half of uh, the dynamic duo that owns Cafe Brio, the foundation, the staple on Vancouver Island and maybe BC. Um, and uh, I, I would say that, Greg, you're one of those types of people that are inspirational and have taught a lot of other people in the restaurant industry how to be hospitable. And, uh, for that, I mean, I, I, I thank you very much for all that and, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. What a nice thing to say. Well, you know, (laughs) you're right in front of me. What else am I going to (laughs) say? And you did it so convincingly. Have you been practicing in the mirror? Uh, for you about have, three weeks. So. <laughs> about three weeks I've been practicing that intro. No, it's really nice to have you here. And Kaylin, the only thing that would make this better is if you were here in the room as well. But uh, I, I feel your warmth from way over there. <laughs> yeah, well, I wish I was there too with you, with you boys. Um, Greg, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? And you've got a very storied history. Maybe give us a, a bit of a... Um, you know, a resume, if you will. How it started? Accomplishments. Yeah, how it started. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to tell you. Well, uh, if we uh, if we go back to me not finishing university and oh. dropping out halfway through my first year, guy, well, I couldn't apply myself. And um, my buddy, uh, a buddy and I decided to go to Europe together. We'd been working up north in Prince George for six months, laboring. We went to Europe, bought a Volkswagen van in Amsterdam, drove to the Spanish Sahara in Morocco and back again for six months. Oh my God, I got great stories of Morocco, but I don't know if you can tell them on air. About big Uh, blocks of hash for for no money down? (laughs) Oh, oh, (laughs) Oh. good Lord. But those were back in the days when you could survive that. Um, In any case, I came back (laughs) from that and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I got the university prospectus and started looking through courses and I was thinking, oh, anthropology, sociology, because I like stuff like that. But oh, thank God I never got a degree in that. I don't know what I would have done with it. Well, th- those are both things that ha- yeah. have to do with people, don't they? Yeah. And coincidentally, the girl who was, she was my girlfriend at the time from Connecticut. I met her in Spain and talked her into coming to UVic. And she got a job and said, hey, if you need a job, you should come down. They're hiring at this restaurant called the Kagan Cleaver. Uh, Well, I didn't know anything about restaurants at all. It never even crossed my mind. But I went down that day and got hired that day. Uh, They started you at the bottom in those days, so I was a dishwasher. And then two or three weeks later, I was a busboy. And then a month later, I was a waiter. And the bartender took me under his wing and taught me everything about it. It was about a year and a half I was there. And what a great grounding. You know, it's still to this day, you can talk to people all over the province who got their start at the keg. It was a real like sounding board for everybody who's in the industry today. So um, anyway, I... Uh, was up for the assistant manager job at the keg and a new manager came in and fired everybody myself included 
Oh, he took an instant. Dis- oh, he took an instant dislike to everybody, and he put. It- he took us aside one by one, and we were all told we no longer conformed to the keg image. Oh. <laughs> we, oh, I would, well, well, and I was that. up for the assistant manager job. I was I was on the way, but this new guy came in and nope, didn't like us. So I just got another job in another restaurant, a little Denmark it was called. George Sorensen, he was the chef to the king of Denmark oh. as a young man. Was came, that in Bastion Square? In Bastion Square. Wow. The little Denmark. And they had another outlet on Cook Street. There's a bank sitting there now. Oh, no way. They or is it the bank is sitting there? Oh, it's Glenn Barlow's liquor store. Oh, you, you also have a That was the building then. that it was in. Okay. Yeah. And um, that way, he was a great guy to work for. Really liked him a lot. And then I went to, got another job at um, the new Chateau Victoria. They were just opening it. Danielle Rigolet. You know that name, I'll bet. No. Oh, yeah. Danielle. Everybody yeah. knows Danielle. Yep. He was the chef. Huh. And myself and a friend of mine were the first two waiters that got hired there. And uh, uh, that was a great year or so under our belt. John Peaky. I don't know if you get, do you remember the name hmm. Peaky? He I, had a restaurant. His restaurant was called Peaky's. He was an Italian guy. Absolutely full on authentic. I bet you Pete would know him. But, yeah, um, Pete probably would know him. Yeah. Uh, he's not in the business anymore, but. Um, he was the uh, manager of the restaurant. He took an instant dislike to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see a real and trend forming tre- here. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, he caught me one night. I was say I had been. Um, I was a server there, and I'd been talking to some customers, and we were getting along really good, having a great chat, and we were we were good friends by the end of it. So I said, "Well, let me see you to the, in the elevator. You had to go down in the elevator." I said, "Let me just. I'll walk you to the elevator." And we said good night. We're standing in front of the elevator, and and as the doors are closing, and I waved goodbye to them. I said, "Thanks a lot, folks. See you again sometime." I turned around, and there's John Peaky staring at me. He looked at me, and he went, "Folks, did you just call them?" Folks, <laughs> that, was, that was the objection, and he wow. gradually cut me off the off the schedule. Oh wow! Yeah, because you were supposed to be, yes sir, oh. no sir. Oh, thank you so much for, and that's why to this to this day, and all the restaurants I've been involved with, I say to the staff when they first start working there, you do not ever treat the customers like that. I want you to treat mm. those customers like you've got a ver- your best friends are coming to your house for dinner. And when you've got two or three couples coming to your house for dinner, how do you treat them? What do you say when they first arrive? Hey, You're not yes sir, <laughs> no sir. Right. It's going to be something sarcastic. You're going to have a little fun with them. I said, trust me, people will respond way better to that because it's sincere. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. Wow. Uh, Why d- don't more people get it? That's good advice. Well, and we're, we're, we're all in the hospitality. The Bread and Butter is a hospitality group. And, um, I it's mean, kind of in the name, isn't it? It, it, <laughs> it, it is. And to, to think back, I, I remember you, you saying for a long time, you treat people like you're welcoming them, welcoming, welcoming them into your home. And I've always run 2% jazz like that. It's always been... You're, you're coming into my home, and I just want to make you feel better just by being there, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally got that from you. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, are, are you like that at your house when you have people over, too? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if well, it was just a professionalism. No, there, or... no, there has to be a little sarcasm and stuff. How, what are you like with your friends? Yeah. I'm, you know, you're kid same. around with them a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, it's just kind of natural. What did I say to Kaylin when we first came on? I didn't expect somebody that old. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. You know, it's the it's the Irish humor in me. Uh, the, the, it's it's my people. We're sarcastic. Uh, fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm going very, to I'm uh, going to I'm Dublin in May. Are you? Yeah. Nice. What's that, Kaylin? And arming as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> Disarming, I guess I should say. Oh, that too. <laughs> you're you're not sure how you you know depending on if it's going to be stuffy or stiffy stiff or whatever then. Yeah, you uh, immediately break the ice, which is a perfect. You know, if you don't know anything about hospitality, that advice that Greg, Greg just gave yeah. the single will make yeah. you feel like they're at home. But you sure yeah. can't do it. You cannot do it in a way that l- makes you look like you're acting or something. It's no, got to be. You yeah. have to be sincerely be that kind of a person. So every time I was hiring people, 
in my interviews, I didn't interview like a normal person at all. I, this was not like the HR department at all. I, you just get people talking about it and get, and get them settled into their own personality, and eventually they will show you the kind of person they really are. I like that. Like when, when you're interviewing somebody who's, yeah. someone, you're asking them about their favorite books or movies or what, the, what they yeah. like to do. and yeah. Whatever. Yeah, just ha having yeah. a casual conversation with them That's teaches it. you a, a lot yeah. about a person, right? It really does. Yeah. You look in their eyes and see if there's any connection there, and, and hopefully they've got a really good sense of humor. I like that. Right. Because you're going to need it at, our, at my place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I, I mentioned you're your one, one half of the dynamic duo. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about the other half? The other Sylvia. The Sylvia, yeah, yes. The, the Sylvia. What would you like to know? Well, where, where, where did you guys meet? Oh, Sylvia was a customer... Uh, at my first restaurant, the Herald Street Cafe. Oh. We opened, I think, in June or July, and Sylvia came in as a customer in late August, early September. That was 90, 82? 82. Somewhere? 82. It was 82. And she was, at the time, she was volunteering to help with um, special needs kids. Okay. And so she had taken this young man on as as her her companion, if you will. Right. She would go to his house, and her mom and his mom and dad were thrilled that she was a huge help to him because he really couldn't be out in public, not really. And he would have been a teenager, I'm guessing. And she brought him in, and the re the reason I noticed them, what not only because Sylvia was stunningly beautiful, but the young man, as soon as he sat down. Took his shoes and socks off. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> to be careful. Uh, to, be, uh, to be comfortable. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Sylvia said, oh, don't mind him. I said, well, we don't mind at all. Not a big deal. But it struck up a conversation. Okay. And eventually the subject of Italian food came around because Sylvia is born and raised in Italy. And we were talking about well, different Italian foods that we had done at, at uh, Herald Street. And she said, oh, if you think that's Italian, <laughs> you got to come over to my place. I'll cook you. and Because my friend Joe and I got to know Sylvia about the same time. She said, I'll invite the two of you over for dinner and give you my mom's olive ripiene. Olive ripiene is stuffed olives that are peculiar to her hometown of Ascoli. That's where they're from. And how do you say that again? Olive, olives. Olivier? Ripiene. Ripiere. Ripiene. 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 Is that what I would see her stuffing in the... the, the you, Remember those? Her mom. The stuffed in the olives back and, and the breaded and deep fried? Oh, oh my, my God. God. Those yeah. are amazing. Well, when Maria passed, that was the end of that. Uh, Too labor intensive. <laughs> you know, that, that, that was one of the things I, I love coming into Cafe Bria. I used to deliver coffee every Friday to you guys. And yeah. I used to sit at the bar for a pint. Not, not necessarily for the beer, although it was always good. Yeah, yeah. But to see what, what you guys were doing and to, to see mom in the back corner she stuffing was sitting olives. In the back cor oh, of always, course. You always. saw that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'd be downstairs smoking cigarettes and taking phone calls. Yep. <laughs> She'd be stuffing olives and yep. Sylvia would be arranging flowers. Yeah, and exactly. everything got done just in time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it was. Yeah, it was awesome. I used so to anyway, love watching. So the night that I was supposed we were going over to Sylvia's for yeah. dinner, uh, Joe called me an hour before, and he said, oh, man, I'm sick as a dog. He said, I, he said there's no way I can go. I said, well, oh, I'll go over by myself. We can't leave her hanging. So I went <laughs> over by myself, and the rest is history. Wow. Oh, and how, how many times have you thanked Joe for that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, Joe wasn't sick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you don't think so? No, <laughs> I've, I've heard that before. <laughs> you know, you could be so right about that. Let me ask you a quiet, like, okay, you, you, we touched on Harold Street. Obviously, Sylvia, I want to talk more about Sylvia and how you guys and when you started um, Cafe Brio. But the transition period between the when you became an owner, like, how did that all go? Like, you know, where were you at in your career with that decision? You know, was it a partnership? Was it, you know, were you by yourself? Like, how did you start that whole thing? Oh, Sylvia and I t together as partners, you mean? No, or no, no. Going back, we missed the gap. For Herald Street. I want to talk about Herald Street Cafe a little bit, how mm -hmm. you got into it, how you started it. Oh, yeah. Your, well, I, uh, Sylvia, I didn't know Sylvia when we started Herald Street. She had nothing, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, she had nothing to yeah. do with Herald Street. I, just, I met her there as a customer. 
and ev and eventually, and I said to her after just a couple of dates, I said, you are wasting your time with that office job. I said, you really should be in this business. You've got a perfect personality for being a server at, at Herald Street. Oh, yeah, but I've never done it before. I said, never mind. You know, come on in. We'll train you. And then the, the rest, yeah, and that's how that started. But before it, um, I was working at the Oak Bay Beach Hotel. And right. the chef and my best friend was Mark Finnegan. And uh, Mark was, after we all split up and went our separate ways, left the Oak Bay Beach Hotel, Mark became the chef at Shawnee's. Oh, no. Remember Shawnee's, yeah. uh, Mike Murphy's place now. Mm -hmm. And I used to visit Mark because uh, uh, I knew how to get in the side door right across the street from the Union Club. Yeah. It's a back entrance to the kitchen. And Mark and I would hang out. I was selling real estate at the time, and the market was heading south very quickly. And I said, we have got to open our own restaurant, Mark. Every time I was, a, every time I've been to your house for dinner, those meals that you make for us, I'm telling you, if we could open a restaurant and do all of the, your food like that, I guarantee you we would be successful. And I said, the next time we get for dinner, we are going to sit down, and we are going to cost out everything on that menu just for the hell of it. So we sat down, we had dinner. I said, okay, what did you pay for all of this stuff, everything? Did you keep track? He said, yeah, I got a pretty good idea. So I got, I'm there with pen and paper, adding everything up, figured out how much it would cost to put that plate on the table, and I said, look at that. I said, if you want to get like a 31% food cost, here's what you have to charge for that meal. $8.50. Oh, my God. And he said, what? There's no way. I said, Mark, the numbers don't lie. I said, and everybody else in town at the time was twelve to fourteen ninety five for entrees. I said, you watch wow. what happens. You start doing your food, which blows all the rest of this stuff away, by the way. I said, I guarantee you they're going to line up out the door. Huh. And sure enough, within a week of opening, they were lined up down the street every day. And it was because of Mark's food. So I talked him and his partner, Helen, into giving up everything they were doing and throwing in with me as partners. They had to come up with some money as well. Helen was a cocktail waitress at the Red Lion. Oh, wow. And oh, she, yeah. And she, yeah. Was the, and she was the union rep. <laughs> so she was making decent money as a cocktail waitress back in those days. So, uh, yeah, she, had to, she needed some talking into it. Mark and I were ready to go. Uh, so they were my two partners in okay. the beginning. Uh, we mortgaged ourselves to the eyeballs. My good friend, Glenn, he got $10,000 together from his employer, a guy who owned another restaurant in town, Il Buco, La Buca. Okay. La Buca. It was on Cook Street years and years ago. Wow, it's going back. Oh, Holy way cow. back. Les. <laughs> Les was the guy. Les gave us... Oh my God! How much was it? It was like twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Wow! He went to his bank and put his name down as collateral, and they gave me the first big bank loan. And then Mark and Helen wow. gave me ten. My mother and father gave me ten. Glenn, my other partner, he put in ten. The electrician on the job site, his bill was twenty thousand. I talked him into holding back ten of it in exchange for a piece of the action. Huh. And I sold my vehicle and put in 10. So it was little bits and pieces here, there, and everywhere. Oh. And we had a meeting with everybody, and I said, look, if you base the way we're going to split up this partnership here based solely on money put in, I said, I'm going to end up with 5 to 10%. That's it. And everybody around the table said, oh, that, well, that's not right. I said, well, no, it's not right. So <laughs> here's what we're going to do. These are arbitrary numbers, and I showed them the numbers, and I said, I think this is fair. This whole thing is my idea. I've done all the work on this. You all get a nice percentage of it, but I think we should start with I get 50%, you get 50%, and then your 50% gets split up a bit, and we have strict rules in place about how we're going to pay you back. And everybody got paid back within the year. Oh, wow. That's everybody. Quick. Oh, wow. It was instant. I'm not kidding, Kalen. You had to see it to believe it. And Friday and Saturday. Crazy. Friday and Saturday open till three in the morning, and at five to three in the morning, I used to have to go out to the lineup on the street, 
and say, you, you, and you, we can get you in before we close. The rest of you, sorry, nobody's leaving. Oh, come on, Greg, bring some tables outside. <laughs> oh. <Listen to> that. <laughs> so they would line up and they would sit down for dinner at 3.30. Out, outside on... No, no, no oh, inside. Inside, okay. But that, but <laughs> we're talking, us, we're bringing it might tables take us outside. that long to get somebody in, right? So they're not ordering until 3.30. You can imagine when they went home. Oh. Oh, and, it was 5 the in the morning. Well, now by yeah. that time, we all got our second wind. So we'd pull up, pull tables together in the back with the staff and start drinking. <laughs> So we'd open several bottles of wine, and uh, and sometimes we'd even go for a little skinny dip at 7 in the morning out to one of those little lakes oh, geez. that you have to walk into. <laughs> oh, oh, they were great wild. times. But the difference what, was we were year? all young. You start um, Herald Street Cafe. Uh, that was 82. And with how? Okay, so obviously, I mean, I've been to Herald Street a number of times back in the day. Um, when it was, how long was it, were you open and how, why did you get out of Herald Street Cafe? Oh yeah. Interesting story. That one. Well, first of all, how, how we got into it, Mark and I, when we decided we were going to do that restaurant, uh, I said, look, there's only one part of town I'm interested in. And I said, I, I want to be in that scuzzy industrial area down there where there's nothing happening. And the reason, and, yeah. and Mark said, well, why down there? I said, watch what happens. You put a really cool restaurant in a scuzzy location and they will absolutely, because there's nothing like it in Victoria. Yeah. Nobody had ever done that before. What a great thing to do. It's like pre, pre uh, kind of yeah, gentrification, yeah. right? So we thought, we drove down the street one day, I drove down the street and saw the for lease sign in that building. I phoned immediately. It was a guy, I think in Alberta, uh, there was nothing going on the building because the building was derelict. I didn't realize it at the time until they got me inside, and I took one look at it, and I went, oh, my. <laughs> the second and the third floor were open to the elements because the roof had caved in. It was a pigeon roost. <laughs> wow. Kaylin, it was a pigeon roost. The entire second and third floor. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So who You had that? to have rubber boots on because the pigeon shit was two or three inches deep. Ew. Everywhere. <laughs> Jeez. And it was in the end, it was an orig in an almost original condition from when it had been a Chinese rooming house before the turn of the century, late 1800s, early wow. 1900s. The communal, wow. the communal kitchens were still there. Everything. The rooms, bunk beds. It was like a museum covered in bird shit. So, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so we sealed ourselves off on the second floor. I said to the guy, look, there's a lot of work to do here. I want to have uh, six months uh, rent-free, and then I'll pay you $3.50 a square foot. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we exactly. I'm looking at Kalen's face <laughs> yeah, to, see, to see the reaction to three fifty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so needless to say, it was a gift, and that was for five years. So, and then it was wow. another 350 after that. It was, it was really nothing. Um, so in the, t the TI budget, like how much did it cost you to renovate that? Oh, I mean, uh, it well, it would have been crazy. Well, yeah, but it was back in the day when a really good head carpenter who knew his shit was $10 an hour. And, yeah. and could actually do the work and And he people. could actually do it. Yeah. So I got a, we got a guy who came in to uh, apply, and or I met him through somebody else. I can't remember what it was now. Yeah, I don't recall how I met him, but he had his own crew uh, and just a really good guy, just a private contractor guy, and I liked his work ethic and the way he talked, and he was just a wonderful human being. I still see him to this day now and again. And uh, he was 10 bucks an hour, and his crew would have been seven wow. or eight. And they worked double speed, and honestly, it was just fabulous. And like I said, the electrician, the electrician's total bill, Kalen, was $20,000. They had to wow. bring the power from, uh, uh, oh, what's that uh, second hand shop way down at the end of, uh, of Herald Street, uh, uh, along Wharf there, from oh, Wharf Street. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, Valley Village. Valley Village. Valley yeah. Village. The power had to come. Uh, if you remember, it was railway lines there. Back in those days, the railway line ran right along the street, in the middle of the street. It's against the law 
to bring power over a, a, a railway line unless, oh. the oh, you got some serious hoops to jump through. So the electrician broke the news to, to me, and I said, oh, man, you got to be kidding me. He said, we can, we can get it done because the railway line isn't used anymore. We'll use that argument. And he said, I'm pretty sure City Hall will be okay with it. But he said, it's going to take some time and extra money, and we got to run the power from down there to you. Uh, so far. Yes. Oh, my God. And it's not like there wasn't power out front. Yeah. But it had to, because of our power needs, it had to come from way down there. In any case, his bill was only $20,000. Imagine what that would be today. It would, oh, be, yeah. well, it would be well into six figures yeah. easily. So that's, this is why it was so easy back then, Kalen. It wasn't a big deal at all. Honestly, I, I don't think it cost 200000 to put it all together. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and you were able and to that barter from scratch. that, too. And th- there wasn't even any venting for the kitchen. Wow. For the, if, and you know how, how difficult that can be. And we had to yeah. go up through the middle of the building, three stories to the roof. But luckily, on the inside of that building, there were uh, like a big voids in the middle where the apartments that they end of, ended up putting in there looked on to this thing. And it would have been as wide as from here to the other side of this room okay. and twice as long. Oh, so you could it was just like a little interior courtyard. Huh. So we went right up the inside, up the top, and away you go. And it was before they put the apartments in. So we were grandfathered in. Oh, so they had and to build then, around. Yeah, I had eventing. the right of first refusal on the building. But uh, Wakefield Construction saw... Huh. Their offices were across the street, and they wanted more space. They saw that a, a major tenant was going in. Well, if you're going to be a landlord, you need one major tenant to guarantee yeah. your payments. So they made an offer in the building. We were unable to match it because we'd only been in business a month or two, and they ended up buying the building. Wakefield Construction eventually became Patterson, uh, what, what, Bill Patterson. Can't remember the name of his company now, Italian name. If you heard it, you'd go, oh, those guys. In yeah, any yeah, case, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I think you know who, you probably know who I mean if yeah, you heard I the name. In about. any case, uh, yeah, that's how it, that's how it started. Um, now I've lost my train. Where were we? Yeah, uh, they, 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 they bought the building. Now. Yeah, they bought the building, turned it into apartments. We were there for a very long time. And uh, they sold the building eventually, and the guy that bought the building was a very good friend of my mother and father, so I knew him really well. And when, they, when the building was going to be sold, I... Now, it must have, or was it Wakefield that was doing it that sold it? I think it was Wakefield that was selling it. In any case, um, we couldn't afford to buy the thing at the time, but... He was really good to us, and he said, I'll let you know if I'm going to sell it again. I talked to Mark and Helen about it, and Helen was not interested in owning the building at all. So the whole thing fell apart. And I said, man, that you are being very short-sighted here. Yeah, but as soon as the tenants find out that we're the landlords, they'll be knocking oh. on the back door all the time. And I, I said, Helen, that, that's why they have management companies. Yeah. We don't even have to be the face of it. Well, long story short, we could have had the building for, oh, like 750000 or oh something at the time, and it sold for $1.2 oh, the next day. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it was just stupid. This is one of the, you asked me why I sold? I'm afraid it was Helen. Uh, 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 there were behind-the-scene things happening. I, I don't know if I'd. Yeah, I don't really want to get into it particularly, no, but yeah. but there were some dis- many disagreements, and I finally said, you know, we'll let you guys have it, and uh, Sylvie and I are going to move on. Yeah, you know, partnerships are are hard, even when they're they're friends and you get along. For and they were they were so my best friends, but things happened as the years went by, and the money started coming in, and it changes how people's minds work. Yeah, he- Mark still a yeah. very good friend to this day. I love Mark dearly. And Helen, I don't know what turned her around, but it was, I don't know, it's just the way it was. It was most unfortunate. Yeah. So we moved on. They bought me out for the amount of money that I wanted. And uh, Sylvia and I got approached during that whole time while we were going back and forth about the money. Bob Wright from the Oak Bay Marina. The mogul. He, yeah, he heard what was going on. 
and he had been a, he was a really good customer of mine at at Herald Street. He sent one of his vice presidents to come and have a chat with me, and they said uh, Mr. Wright would like to have a sit down with you, and if you have a mind to about uh, possibly throwing in with him on the Oak Bay Marina project. And I thought, oh, uh, well, not exactly my kind of restaurant, but oh, what the hell, sure, we'll have a sit down. So. Bob and his wife took Sylvia and I out for dinner to his favorite Japanese restaurant. And before the meal was over, we'd hammered out a deal. Um, I said, I will come on board, but only for three years, tops. Because uh, Sylvia and I have our own project we want to do someday. We're going to be keeping an eye out for a piece of land. He said, well, if you can help me for three years, that'd be great. And uh, so we signed on. And so luckily, we got to have a hand in the way the place looks today how the f certainly all, everything about the food that happened in the beginning and the chefs and everything, Sylvia and I put all of that together. J.C. Scott, you probably know, he was... Oh, the, yeah, J.C. J.C. was the designer on the site. Now, when I came on to that project and we, and, uh, we had said yes to it, they invited us over to Bob's house on Beach Drive. All of his vice presidents and J.C. were there, and they wanted to show us all of the plans that they had for the place. They got the plans, and I kind of had the impression that J.C. wasn't maybe fully on board with it. But Bob is a very forceful guy, and so J.C. was yeah. going along with it. He'd helped with all the drawings. Well, they had, before I came on board, they had made a point of going up and down the west coast of America, and uh, I think they went to Japan or Hawaii or something like that, uh, looking at seafood restaurants on the water to get a real cross-section of different ways you could go. Because obviously the old marina had to go. Yeah. Do you remember those old wicker chairs? Yeah. And, that yeah. looked like something yeah. out of a Snake Charmer movie? Yeah. It had to go. So they showed us the plans. Sylvia and I took one look at the plans, and we said, you're kidding. Really? This is it. It was floor-to-ceiling Disco, oh my God. fish tanks, circular, three feet, three feet across, oh my God. with fish and everything in bubbles. Oh. Does, does that sound? Does that sound like something you might see in a Japanese discotheque? Yeah, yes, yeah. It, yes, it does. And I said, "Well, we just time. Sylvia and I both said, I, it's just, it's too garish. Holy smokes! I said, look what you've got here." Get all those curtains down, and what are you looking at? Yeah. The most spectacular the view in the city. It's cantilevered over the water. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a and, gorgeous room. And, and you can see the look on J.C.'s face. I think he was relieved to hear somebody finally say something. Who uh, <laughs> We were in a position where we could speak up to Bob because we were brand new. Right. We were the golden children. <laughs> so and that, that lasted about a year, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then it was uh, not, so, not so much fun. But anyway, the design, the way you see it today, is because of J.C. and a woodworking guy that he knew who did brilliant, brilliant work. And the, the stepping it back so that it was still slightly terraced, so that everybody, even in the bar at the top, were looking down over the water. Oh, and okay. get rid of the curtains so that it was just the view. So we were very lucky to be able to put our stamp on it. But uh, things changed. Uh, I said, the only argument I made was, I said, Bob, I th it's too many seats. You're going to have trouble filling these seats at different times of the year. Uh, no, no, that's, that's what we're doing. Okay, fine. Well, sure enough, of course, January, February roll around, and we were busy. We had, I remember one night, Sinclair Phillip from the Souk Harbor House was in for dinner. Oh, yeah, and great. it was early February. The weather was shite. It was blowing sideways and bitch cold out. He sat there for dinner, and he called me over, and he said, I can't believe how many people you got here. There was maybe 40 people in the room. But that was on a shitty night in February in Victoria in Oak Bay. Yeah, it's kind of it was still It was still good numbers, you know, not bad at all. My Bob didn't think so. So yeah. eventually, after our three years was up, and we were at each other's throats by the end of it, uh, I almost punched him one night, and he was laying hands on me, and oh yeah, it was brutal. And uh, <laughs> so it was New Year's Eve was our last night there. I walked out the door, and it was like an enormous weight came off my shoulders. 
What and it was year with, was that when you left? Uh, well, that was uh, 94, 93, and okay. I was there three years. We started our project in 96. It must have been 95 or something. Yeah, because I think I, I was there just as you guys were leaving. Could be, yes. I, 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 been, I remember you guys. I think it was around there. 95. And then, sure enough, within a year, he started with the Japanese tour buses. You could come into mm. that parking lot many nights, yes. and there'd be four or five Japanese tours parked there. You know, in and out real quick, twenty nine ninety five. Oh, yeah, pathetic, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> oh, pathetic. Anyway, yeah. and now the place is closed. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they're closed. Yeah, yeah. you know, they. Ha- it's, sorry, you brought it on yourself. And Bob's gone, so that just shows you. Yeah, I don't know what it's whatever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what so that's how you? that's how that all came about. And then at the end, there we were, we had started because we knew that New Year's Eve was our last night, Kalen, and uh, we had started, of course, the search for a piece of land or something to buy. Uh, at the time, um, Frank Bury. Do you know Frank Bury? Love Frank. Frank's awesome. Hey, Frank's a yeah. great guy. Uh, old A and W guy. <laughs> yeah, I used to own all the A and W. Yeah, 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 exactly. So Frank was uh, consulting then, and he was a good customer at the marina, friend of Bob's. And we told him what we were up to. It was it was no secret. And he said, "Oh, he said, Greg, the oh the best deal out there right now." He said, "Honestly, you should make a phone call right away." The um, what is now the spaghetti foundry? What, what did what, did, uh, what was it called? Oh, uh, the Chris Costin had it. Chris Costin owned it. Water for or no? No, water. well, the Water Club, Mark and Helen did, but before the Water Club, it was Chris Costin oh, owned it. Seafood that. restaurant. Yeah, it was all seafood. Um, he said that's the best thing out there right now, and I said, really? I said, I I, I got to disagree with you there. I said, there's number one, there's no parking. I said, so the only people you're going to get is walk by tourist traffic. I said, number two, it's huge. It's more square footage than you need. Mm -hmm. Number three, look who owns it and and make a wild guess what the lease is going to cost you for that huge space that you need half of. I said, no, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Don't like the sound of that. Thanks anyway. And then months later, we found out that Mark and Helen, Helen took one look at it, got completely sucked in, and they bought uh, Then they put That was the, the beginning of the end of Harold Street Cafe then, too. They, yeah, the right. water club. Yeah. They lost the water club. Water, they put a lot of money yeah. into it. The lease was too much. They ended up losing their homes, their cars, oh. and the Harold oh. Street Cafe. And, oh. Helen, and Helen had breast cancer during the early stages of it. That's yeah, bad. it's too bad. And during that time, Sylvia and I, did, we did that drive with Mark, and I drove down Fort Street, and I looked to my left, and I said, oh, look at that parking lot right there, yeah, was... right beside IDAR. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, the yeah. Par- it was the parking lot for Griffin Plumbing and Heating. They were behind yeah. on View Street and owned all four lots all the way through. So Sylvia and I drove by. We saw the thing. I said, oh, let's go to City Hall. Let's find out who owns that piece of land. I want that one. So we drove to City Hall. That was in the days when they used to have that microfiche that they would keep in the lobby. Yeah. So we looked it up, and sure enough, Griffin Plumbing and Heating. I said, oh, it's Larry and I his brothers. Yeah. <laughs> well, Larry, their son, Tom was the first person I ever hired as an employer at the Herald Street Cafe. Huh. So we got to know the family. They all came in for dinner all the time. Tom was one of our very best friends ever. So we, I said, let's go and knock on his door. So we did. We said, and he said, oh, hi, guys. How you doing? What are, what, are, what are you up to? I said, well, we'll just get straight to the point. That piece of land behind us here, Sylvia and I would like to buy it. And he went, uh, oh, well... He said, you know, it's funny you should mention it. Our wives have been pestering us to sort of pull out and semi and retire. They were in their 80s at the time. He oh, said, let wow. me talk to my brother, and we'll get back to you. A week later, he called, and he said, yep, you can have it for 600 And when I finished choking, I said, yeah, that's, that's a big time. phrase. Yeah. That was a big number back for, then. For a parking lot. Well, it wasn't for the parking lot. I, the oh. only way to get the parking lot was to buy the building. It wasn't two lots. It was one lot. Oh. It was one lot with a parking lot. So the building beside us, which is now a place called Suits You, he sells yeah. bathing suits and workout gear, that kind of thing. 
That was part of the deal. So it was 600000 for the whole works. Well, I learned my lesson the hard way from having partners. And I said to Sylvia, look, we have a, because we'd worked out a plan to use the whole works, knock down or at least mostly dismantle the building and go three stories, step it back, make an open courtyard that the restaurant would be all centered around the courtyard. Oh, it was going to be beautiful. Three stories, apartments that we could sell. Uh. But you needed a money partner. Yeah. And you know what happens when you get a money partner? They screw yeah. you, they screw they you screw two you or three years later. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. going to do that whole shotgun clause bullshit, and yeah. it's usually he with the money wins. Absolutely. Oh, they, yeah. oh, they buy you out, but you've lost your dream. Yeah, and, and you know never come out on the right Hell side Hell no. That. So I put an ad in the – before we actually owned anything, I put a tiny discreet ad in the newspaper, and I said, building for sale, Fort Street. And a phone number. And how, uh, roughly how many square feet it was. Well, of course I got calls. And so I had to kind of weed people out over the phone because I didn't own it yet. So I didn't <laughs> yeah. want somebody else. <laughs> but on the other hand, I needed to know that I had a buyer because I was going to subdivide. Huh. I wanted to know for sure I had a buyer for the building. Yeah. That's so this, this, uh, the guy who eventually bought it from me, is I still see him to this day. Uh, he came on board, paid three fifty for the building. I got the building lot for two fifty. Wow! Now wow. that was wow. a good that was a good deal. So that's some sm smart forward thinking. Yep, and a bit lucky, I bet. Yep, and yep. we had to borrow. I think the bank loan originally was somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand, and we'd already ponied up some of our own money. Uh, did, you, did your parents help with that at all? Or? My mom and dad were in on it as yeah. well. Okay. My, well, my mom. Yeah, okay. my mom was in on it. She. <sighs> Her and I both put in an equal amount of money for the land holding. Okay. And then the rest of it, Sylvia and I financed the restaurant. That was four hundred. Sylvia and I did that part. Mum and Mum ponied up for half of the uh, of the land, and then we paid her back. And we paid everything off in nineteen years. And that was quite a while ago. Amazing. But you know, so you you guys built that building. Yeah, yeah. This is such an interesting story for me because I have never known the background of that. Oh yeah, obviously, yeah. So that's super fascinating. And you got bits you and did pieces a, you from did a bit of mini land development deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, as I said to Sam before we opened here, the one thing I learned after all these years: if you want to have anything for yourself at the end of a restaurant career, you better move heaven and earth to own that building. Even yeah. if you got to mortgage yourself to the eyeballs, because back then taking on that amount of debt was considered insane. But if you sat yeah. down and did the math, the rent that you would have to pay covered the mortgage. So all I had to do was yeah. talk the bank into doing it. So I phoned every bank. Only one of them would even give me an interview. The rest of them was like, ah, uh, no, sorry, we don't finance restaurants. And they still yeah, but don't. we're going to own the land. <laughs> no, no, sorry, we're just not interested in restaurants. Thanks anyway. Click. TD Bank said yes. Oh. I went in wow. for my interview with them on a Monday. There were four guys in the office, the general manager, the loans manager that I'd spoken to, and two other guys. Three of them were regular Herald Street customers. Oh, nice. Oh, you, so, so you, see what, what was... you see what's going to happen? I, I yeah. had that instant in, and we had Beautiful. the money was okayed by Friday. Holy crap. Wow. That it was, doesn't it was instant anymore. Because, number one, we owned the land, and we were, able, we were willing to sign it over to them. And number two, they knew our track repu reputa reputation, and they knew that, they were, that the odds were really good that they'd get their money back, and everybody got paid back real quick. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that building was built with 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 old pieces of history of Victoria as well, wasn't it? Oh like yeah. Little bits like the bar was built out of Oh the, the, the old, old remember the old and... the old Sir, Sir James Douglas school. Oh, that's what it was. That that was the the bar uh the bar was their original floor. Oh, wow. But the floor in the restaurant, that was the be the most interesting story. Uh, do you remember the old Viking aircraft ha hangar at the airport? It collapsed yep. under the weight of that snow in 96 because it was a big flat roof building. I heard like 10,000 square feet or something like that. I, I don't know for sure. But it collapsed. And the wood that we have on our floor now was the wood that was in their ceiling. 
Wow. And it had been there since before the Second World War, air cured all those years. So, yeah, it was fur, but it was uh, tongue and groove, old growth, the real deal, two by eight. Oh, wow. It was something else, I'll tell you. Hard as a rock, and look at that floor today. People right. come in all the time and go, geez, how old is this building? Well, it's not. It's new. <laughs> it's a new building with old interior. With all old stuff. Uh, do you remember, were you guys in town when the old Yarrow's shipyard used to be here? Yeah. 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 I don't remember it very well, but I know the name. Well, it's down where uh, uh, Glow is and everything down uh, there now. Right. That was the yeah, old Yarrow's right. shipyard. The uh, shipyard was made of uh, post and beam construction and uh, uh, oh, CETA construction. That's who it was, Bill Patterson at CETA Construction. Oh, that's right, CETA. Yeah. He was able to lay his hands on one of those old posts or beams, about a 30-foot long piece, uh, and two and a half feet to three feet square. Uh, and we had all of the wood milled out of that one piece. So if you're ever oh back goodness. in the restaurant, take a real close look at those big double French doors that open out onto the patio and into the little alcove. Yeah you can see the original nail holes and the knots and everything still in it from before the turn of the century. Oh, my goodness. And, wow. uh, and beautiful, beautiful wood. Now, you, this, this leads me to something I wanted to mention in our, in our talk, is that you guys take really good care of the inside of your restaurant. And every year, I remember you guys closing for a certain amount of time, and, and you would hand redo all, all your tables, Yeah, we're just, reopening, we're just reopening tonight, as a matter of fact, and, and you after two weeks closed. And you've done that for years, right? I've been doing it for years, and it's always a different project every year. Uh, but yeah, the, the tables, those, <laughs> I bet those tables have 15 coats of varathane on them by now. But every, one, every once every three years, I'll go through with a sanding block and just scuff up all the tables and put two more coats of varathane on them. Uh, the, the, the paint in the room, um, we're planning on, we do touch-ups on all the paint where the chairs and the tables touch and Stop gouge. Yeah. So you have to do that all the time. Uh, the art, I just switched up the art again to have something new in the room. Uh, you know, there's a capital work project that you have to do all the time. And you can tell the restaurants that don't do it. Right. You walk in there yep. and you can see the neglect. We won't name names, but you know who they are. It's, it's laziness. <laughs> it's laziness and cheapness. Right. You have You're to, not talking about Zambri's, I hope. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. No, definitely not them. I, but there I, are I some always, places yeah. that just, they don't care about it anymore. It's just a money-making machine. So I, whatever. Well, it, it was always really cool to know that you were you're able to close to you know, put that much energy back in your restaurant. You, you you obviously took vacations, traveled to Italy every year, probably. Yep. Every, every year. We used to until yeah. COVID. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, stupid COVID. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you, you guys were able, and it always impressed me. You were able to take vacations and take two weeks off and work so hard in your restaurant to make it fresh for your customers all the time. Yeah. And it always it always felt like that. It always felt like you guys were put, putting your blood, sweat, all your energy just went into that room, and it was so yeah. obvious. Yeah. So obvious. It was it was duly noted. Oh, thanks. And, you know, and for us, we never we never thought about it that way at all. It's, it, we just always liked what we did so much that it never, you know, it never, ever felt like work. Huh. You know, un until recently, I have to admit, I'm very glad to be retiring. Uh, I'm looking forward to having nothing to do for the first time since I was 10 years old I, without a That's job. I, I'm, I fully embrace it. And it's not that we started disliking the restaurant. It was, like I mentioned to you earlier, those silly little things where somebody's going to get a midnight call to come and fix the grease trap. Or there's going to be something, yeah. always. I... Lost interest in being the guy that gets the call. So it's time for this a new generation to take it over. Um, they will have little issues as well, but in the course in the last two years alone, because of the the age of the restaurant, I've replaced every major piece of equipment. So they're at, yeah, it cost me wow. last last year alone. It cost me fifty grand. It's just everything was twenty six years old, Kaylin. Right. And you know yeah, what happens. It, it, yeah. It's time to replace it. Those ovens are not producing the same temperature anymore. 
it's time to get rid of them. So we replaced all of that, and the entire cold line got replaced. Compressors got replaced. Beer cool. cooler got replaced. So the boys are starting with a clean slate. There will be little issues, I'm sure. There's going to be. But basically, we're, we're turning it over to a new generation because they have ideas. I had my last good idea about 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you still own the land in the building, right? What's oh. that? I'm sorry, Kaylin. I, I think. Sorry, always... Sam. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming obviously you still own the land and building. What talk a little bit about how that deal um, sort of started, and a little bit about the details of. Um, yeah, you know, obviously don't we don't you don't have to talk about price or anything like that, but just how did? Oh, it's too late. We already you... covered that. <laughs> <laughs> how did? How did? Uh, how did they come to owning? Your, or are you selling? Are you deciding to sell or? Oh no, no, no I'm not. Oh no, no, I'm not going to sell the building for a while. Although uh, no, 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 I'm talking about the building. I'm talking about the restaurant. Oh, selling the restaurant? Yeah. You sold the restaurant. I, yeah. Right. Uh, my last day is February three. So we're just we're just doing the countdown. We're we're out of there in two and a half weeks. Oh, so we still have a chance to come and get, get served. Over. Yeah, we'll still be there for a while. But because we're selling it to the chef Sam, yeah. Sam Harris, uh, and he's a name that's well known in town from. Um, uh, Boom and Batten days, as well as other things. And um, Vincent van der Heide, Vinny was also a Boom and Batten. He was the front end guy. And uh, uh, the two of them officially take over February 4. Wow. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm thrilled. I couldn't have hoped for two better guys. With Sam at the helm, it means the food will never change. And with Vinny out front, Vinny's a brilliant front of house manager. He really is. Great wine guy. Okay. Uh, he's got a good sense of humor as well. Um, and don't hold this against him, but he really likes karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> I think I am going to hold it against him. <laughs> <laughs> we just had the staff party. <laughs> Vinny closed up. When, when is your oh, last man. service? What's that? When are you? When are you in? Are you and Sylvia still there up until the close? We are going to be there until February three. That'll be our last night on the floor, and we are going to be working Fridays and Saturdays only until then. So Wednesday and Thursday, we you know we'll be looking in occasionally, but basically, I'm back to my five days off a week, which I've been doing for a year or more. And uh, we'll work Friday and Saturday uh, because it's busy and we like to go in and help. And we like to say goodbye to people that we may not see again. Right. Uh, yeah. So we got three more Friday, Saturdays to go. And are they booked? Do you, do you people know to, to oh, book if they it, want the oh, old when cafe the, when experience? That when the Times Colonist uh, thing came out, everybody assumed we were leaving at the end of December. Yeah. So the last three weeks of December were out of control. Oh, my God. We had, to work oh, every, so good. we had to work every day. It was lined up every single day and full house every day. And mm. lots of people saying goodbye. Yeah. And, there, and we'll see more people on the way out as well. But you don't have to do Valentine's. Oh, that's, I know. That's oh, so nice. Yeah. You got out right before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's a nice timing. Yeah, I'll yeah, say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're thrilled with that. Yeah, let 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 Vinny deal with it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and how how is Sylvia dealing with the the impending retirement herself? Well, I can't imagine her not you know going crazy. Sylvia may end up missing it a bit more than I do. It's hard to say. She's going to have to ease herself into it, whereas I have already come to terms with having nothing to do because, it, in fact, I don't have nothing to do. I've got lots of things to do. Uh, yeah. But Sylvia is going to miss the actual physicality of work. Because mm. when yeah. she's in there, you said it yourself, she's all over the place. She really is. She's yeah. carrying food to tables. She's bussing the tables. She, and what the public doesn't even see after service or a little bit, she's in the back helping the dishwasher. She gives him a ride home later because he, he can't get a bus after 12 o'clock. And, yeah. and, she, and she's chatting with customers. Right. So... The restaurant, in effect, has become our social life. Mm -hmm. How do you replace that? You have a lot of people over for dinner at your house? Well, you have, have some of those famous barbecues that I've heard about? Yeah, it was a long time ago, Sam. <laughs> and as you, as you get older, you get more insular and you don't want to do stuff like that. Yeah. I'm actually, tell me what you think about this. I'll run this idea by both of you. What do you think about a part time job as a greeter at Walmart? 
I, I, I think ah. the color of I think the color of blue wouldn't go with your eyes. I don't know. I think I could raise the bar. Oh, <laughs> you would destroy the bar. <laughs> anyway, I am. I fully embrace it, Sylvia. It may take a while to come around. We'll have to see. Okay. I may have to uh, stage little events for her. Uh, little little pop ups or something. Yeah, little pop. Yeah, little yeah. pop ups. Yeah. Um, you've you've had an incredible uh, group of employees that must feel like like your friends and your family by now because you're able to to keep and maintain employees for oh, hell, a Amber's, long time. Amber's been working for me for 26 years. And how how do you do that? Do you, do you find the right people at first? How do you treat your employees? I mean, right now there's a big movement of treating your employees well and paying them well and yeah. all, all that comes with that is yeah. a bit of a headache. Yeah, we've done we've always done that. You've always done because that. I came up through the ranks at the keg. Yeah. I was the guy yeah. who had to go and clean up the puke at the keg. So I learned every single part of it and it teaches you respect for everybody that's doing that for you. Right. So you better yeah. treat every one of them as equals. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's great advice. So, so that's one thing you were well ahead of in in, in your field because now people are like catching up, trying to maintain their employees, and also the the, the buy local. You were well ahead of the hundred mile diet and the buy local. Oh yeah, that you was were... Sean Shepard. Yeah, oh, okay. I mean Sean uh, <laughs> Sean Shepard's the artist. Um, uh, Sean. Um... Oh, Sean, our first chef. Oh, from from Sean Brasserie. Brennan. Sean Brennan. Brennan Jesus. Yeah. I just I don't know why I went blank on his name. Yeah, Sean. That was that was all Sean doing all of that. Oh, I I I, I was wondering if it was influenced by by Sylvia and her Italian background, the slow slow movement, the slow, the slow food movement. Sorry. Oh, I Italy remember. I was. remember her and Sean talking about it occasionally. Okay. But Sean is the guy that had all the connections. Um, the number one name that comes to mind is Tina Fraser. Oh. I yeah. don't think Tina's in the business anymore, but. Uh, the first year we were there, and we did that, uh, what was that uh, dinner thing? All the restaurants get together at a farm up island and Feast of Fields. Feast oh, of uh, Fields. Feast of Fields. It was the yeah. first Feast of Fields. Oh. And I said to Sh and everybody's showing off like crazy, right? Yeah. I said to Sean, what are you going to do? Tomatoes. I said, uh, to tomatoes, tomatoes and what? He said, tomatoes. That's it. Tomatoes. Wow. I said, oh. <laughs> well, Tina brought in a load of all of her best heirloom tomatoes. And Sean stood there slicing them and sprinkling salt on them and handing them out, and people lost their minds. Honest yeah. to God, Kaylin, it was so good. And nobody was doing anything remotely like that. They were all doing big production numbers. and you know. Yeah. That, but a simple tomato that expresses what your philosophy is all about and the farmer who grew them is standing right there beside him. Man. That was what that's what Feast of Fields was supposed to be like. Yeah. I thought. I I, I remember yeah, the first 100%. couple of those and it was it was amazing going oh, to yeah. the Feast of Fields. It was really oh, great back in those days. It really was. Yeah, yeah. And I think you, you guys turned me on to uh, Cowich and Bay Farms where we would buy our, our chicken for our house because we yeah, would yeah. have the chicken and the duck at Cafe Brio, and I just wanted more of that at home. So oh, yeah. I found out where it was. And, oh, those oh, guys were great. They were great. They were the really were. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know it's been quite a run. We never even got into the wine or anything like that, but we had... We, 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 started, we sort of set standards for wine stuff as well. You Even did. That, was it back in Herald Street or was it Brio that we won the we won a prize for the best wine by the glass program in the world? In the world. In the world. Oh my god. Brio. Glenn yeah, Barlow. you guys had such a good price. Oh, you still do have a good Yeah, wine Glenn wine. Barlow talked awesome. me into that. It was Decanter yeah. Mag Decanter magazine out of London and uh, Robert Mondavi co sponsored this thing. And there were, the world was broken into chunks and our area of competition was North America. So, oh, when, yeah, so when Glenn came to me and he said, can you, you got to submit your list. I said, who are we competing against? He said, North America. I said, uh, for God's sakes. I said, I'm not putting <laughs> all that energy into doing that when we're competing against New York and lots forget it. We don't have pockets like that. Oh, please come on. Well, I ended up doing it and we won the whole thing. And it was the biggest bottle of wine Mandavi had ever made 
The last time they sold one, it sold for $40,000 oh, at a wow. charity auction in South Africa to a personal friend of Mondavi's who paid $40,000 for it. Oh, my goodness. Well, Robert himself signed my bottle. I looked it up online. It was worth $1,500. <laughs> so when Danielle, Rigu when, when Danielle Rigoulet shut down Shea Danielle, I called. I said, would you mind if I bring a bottle of wine? <laughs> well, this was a gigantic quadruple magnum. And we opened it and poured it for the whole room. Yeah. It was fantastic right out of the chute. And an hour later, it was vinegar. Wow. It was very old. Oh, wow. But we had to have we got a nice drink out of it and a great story to tell. I, I remember having the first first bottle of wine that I paid attention to at Cafe Brio. It was uh, by Black Hills. I think. Oh, and no, no, the, Notre Bene. Notre Bene. Yeah. And and because of that, I got a little bit into wine and I went to the Okanagan. And I went there and bought a case of it. It was thirty dollars at the time. Now it's eighty. I know, I know right? <laughs> well, should have yeah, bought more cases. One, a bunch of Calgary that guys that bought it. Too. Uh, hey, I remember um, that exact uh, bottle as well. This has been the most amazing. I, I wish we could do a uh, two-parter on this one. Um, it makes it makes sense to try one day. So well, we maybe, will, and maybe we'll get you and Sylvia on the show because I think that would be. Uh, yeah, it would have maybe. to be late in the afternoon. Sylvia doesn't go to bed until eight in the morning. <laughs> she can't oh. break that habit. She's trying to break it, but it's I don't know. She's a night owl. Yeah. Although she's really a night owl now. Oh, I was I got up this morning at eight. I was walking down the stairs as she was walking up. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> High-fiving each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, give, awesome. give Sylvia our best big hugs. Yeah. She, I wish I, I yeah, would love congratulations, to. Congratulations, Greg. Congratulations on all your successes, and thanks for being an industry leader in, in, in the industry that we love. Yeah. The hospitality business, but you've been a true, true inspiration for, for us at Zambri's and other restaurateurs, too, over the years. So, And I can't wait to come in and... Um, and enjoy some food at Cafe Brio. Oh, thanks, Caleb. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I'd love to see you there. Yeah. As soon as we're off air, I got a question for you. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get off air then. Let's get <laughs> off air. All right. Well, Kaylin, um, next time I'm going to see you, we'll be in person. I look forward to that. And, uh, yeah, I, I love this conversation. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for being here. Thanks it was fun. Time. Best guest. This was awesome. Thanks, I can't Greg, believe how fast that went. I know. I, I threw away my notes about five minutes in. I'm like, oh, Greg, you're just yeah, going to take sorry. this. Yeah, I'm sorry. Shit, I talked to you. I, I talked to you. No, much. it was amazing. Yeah. Was amazing. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Cool. I probably, I got a lot to get off my chest. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bread and Butter Collective's membership includes the following local businesses. 2% Jazz, Bunny's Kitchen, Buzz Coffee House, Eagleite, Big Wheel Burger, Blue Mountain Solutions, Bodega Tapas Wine Bar, Eva Schnitzel House, Farmsgate Foods and Catering, Victoria Chocolate and Company, Drum Roaster Coffee, Habit Coffee, Foo Asian Street Food, The Culinary Arts Program at Camosun, Cafe Fantastico, Fall Epi, Harold Street Brewworks, Hey Happy, House of Botang, Nikkei Ramen Ya, Jenny Marie's Cracker Company, La Pasta, La Rue Patisserie, Mocha House, Part and Parcel, Poco a Pinto Bar, Pizzeria Prima Strada, Keating Pizza, Roast, Table 9 Consulting, Sherwood Cafe and Bar, Sweets by Selena, The Collective Wine Bar and Kitchen, The Drake, Tapa Bar, The Nimble Bar Company, Ruth and Dean, the Whole Beast, The Weenery, Spoon's Diner, Truffles Inspired Catering, and Zambri's. To hear more from the Bread and Butter Collective, go to checknews.ca slash podcasts on Check Plus, or find us on your favorite podcasting platform.